I'm sorry. Did you, did you not catch that? Uh, now is the time that we focus on the Word of God Amen. and learning from God's Word. But I want to welcome everybody to the new year. A uh, little prayer for me is my voice will last. I, I've been very sick, but uh, I've, God has put a message on my heart. So I believe that if you put a message on my heart, he'll give me a voice yes. to speak with. I want to welcome you all and welcome especially if you're visiting with us this morning. It's great to have you with us. Uh, you know, this is a very exciting time for us yes. because we're starting something new. Yes. And you know, God is very good. He likes new things. And when, when the church was started, and we read about it in Acts 2, it says, uh, in Joel, he was quoting the prophet Joel 2.28, and he says, after as I pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. He was initiating something brand new and giving everybody a new vision, a new hope, something new and exciting. And that's a good thing. And that's kind of what's great about January. Yeah. Is January is when we get to start new things, or maybe I should say renew or reboot. Yeah. Or retread, or recalibrate. We get to reload, right? It's kind of like you know, if you're playing a video game, it's just not going well. You just go ahead and shut it off and start over, right? Let's reboot. Let's restart. Yeah. And God is good in that, you know. You can have a really bad day, but no matter how bad your day is, it ends. Yeah. It won't go any longer than 24 hours, <laughs> and you get a brand new one to start out with. Or even if you've had a bunch of bad days and it's just a bad week, you know, you get a new one. And I have some of us have had a bunch of bad weeks and it's bad months, you know. But every 30 days, más o menos, we get a brand new one, right? And, and then if you, sometimes we've had a long streak of bad stuff happening. And we're like, I'm done with this year, you know. So God gives you a brand new year. Merry Christmas. Brand new year for you. That's God's gift to all of us. You know, of course, now with, with new, we, 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 this is the time where we set resolutions and goals. How many of you set any resolutions or goals? Or, or is it, whoa, 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 okay, we gotta talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, this is the time where, you know, the whole, even the even people that have no spiritual bone in their body. No, January is the time where you kind of reset, yeah. right? To, to be a better version of you this yeah. year, yeah. to grow. It's in our genes. It's in our genetic makeup because we are made in the image of God to always strive, to always grow, to reach out, to become more, to be the best we can be, to be as much like God as we can be. Even people who aren't spiritual, they don't know that that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to reach perfection. They're trying to be more than, and we gotta watch out because, you know, the longer you're around, the easier it is to get cynical. Yeah. Well, you know, just, ah, oh, man, we do that every year, and by the third week of January, we don't even remember our goals. You know? <laughs> but, but you can't ever just sink into that. And just be, I'm just gonna be whatever I do. This year, my goal is gonna be whatever I've been and no more. <coughs> I want to show you a video. To get us set up here. Let's, let's, let's watch this video. This year, I'll spend less time with God. I will hide my faith from my co workers. This year, I will spend more and time less. I will read the Bible as little as possible. <laughs> I will remain silent when I know I should speak. This year. This year. This year, I will not share my faith with my best friend. I will shirk leadership responsibilities every chance I get. I will continue to justify my bad behavior. And give God my leftovers. This year. This year. This year, I will let the busyness of life squeeze God out. <laughs> I'm not getting an applause for that video, am I? <laughs> I hope that's 
not where you're at. I hope that you still have some faith in your heart. I hope that you have even a tiny bit of vision. And I know you do because you're here this morning. I hope that you have something to grab a hold of because we're going to go on a spiritual journey this month. Actually, for the next couple of months. And we're going to go on this together and we're going to renew and reload and reboot our faith and be all that God wants us to be. You know, I think about, you know, where we're at as a group. And, and those of you visiting, some of this will apply to you, some of it won't. But try to listen and try to hear whatever has, God is saying to you. Because anytime we read scripture, God is speaking. Yeah. And he's saying something to you. And then you don't want to space out, you know. There's some people you can ignore their texts. You can ghost them. You don't have to answer them. But not God. He sends you a text. You better read it. Okay? If God is trying to reach out to you, don't ignore him. Yep. The guys know what I mean about answer the phone, right, when he calls. I did a sermon when we had the men and women's yeah. services. And I had Bruce, actually. I had Bruce calling me about every 10 minutes. He would give me a call. And, uh, I can tell that some of the brothers were getting irritated with me. Why doesn't he just turn off his phone? And the whole message was answer when God calls you. And how God will keep reaching until you do answer him. So let's, let's, uh, let's see this when I go like this. That's my PowerPoint. Watch. Wait, it's not working. There it goes. There it goes. Uh, there are many challenges to starting over. There are many obstacles to starting over. There's a way to do it. There's a way that God prescribes for us. Things, certain steps we need to take. Now it's got to be, first of all, on our own heart. To be my best for God. To not want to be weak in the Lord. But want to be strong in the Lord. To want to have the best sound that I can have. Amen. <laughs> the truth is, it doesn't make any sense to be a half-hearted Christian. Because half-hearted Christians aren't going to make it. They'll just drag along for a few years, suffer, 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 and then disappear. It doesn't make any sense to let yourself be weak spiritually. Because you'll get pummeled by Satan. You know, you'll have, and sometimes it's even maddening to know enough about the Bible, enough about God, to know how good it should be, but to be so weak spiritually that you can't achieve any of those things and not see the power of God. You good? That's real close. I get hungry, you're in trouble. Change and starting over. In Romans 4, 18, let me ask you, so there wasn't a scripture before that? In Joel. Back up, okay, no, no, that we're good. We'll start there. Well, let me read one to you before. Sorry, I, I must have flipped the scriptures. I'm going to read one to you in Joshua 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out for Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your position and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. This last phrase, now you have to know, for those who don't know the Bible too well, um, repent and get to learn it. It's awesome. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, run out after church and buy one. They're awesome. But this is a phrase that you hear a lot, especially in the Old Testament. Consecrate yourself. Before they did anything great, before anything great happened, God would tell the people, consecrate yourself. Yes. 
What does that mean? Well, consecrate basically means to purify yourself, to get yourself ready, yep. to be spiritually ready. We've been given a brand new year. Are you spiritually ready? Are you where you need to be spiritually for God to do great things in your life? I assume that you're here because you want to have the life God wants you to have. A great life full of victories and hope because you're, you, you, you may be going through challenges. You may be going through suffering. You may have things that have just totally tied you down or enslaved you in life. And you're looking for a way out. And God is the way out. Yeah. He is the one who provides freedom. He is the one who sets captives free. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. And, and that applies to everything from relationships to parenting to, to addictions to all these things. God helps us and gives us very needed help with. But we've got to have our hearts ready for this. And this is so, the history here is he's, he's already taken all the Israelites out of Egypt. You remember that, right? Remember that story? If you haven't read it, at least you saw the movie, right? The Ten Commandments, right? You saw the, and I mean the real Moses, Charles yeah. Heston. <laughs> Not the cartoon one. Okay, but that was okay. They had a better song. They had a better song. Beyonce and Whitney blew it out of the park. Okay, when you believe. But... But you know the story. They were led out of Egypt. It was powerful. It was amazing with plagues and all this kind of stuff and splitting the Red Sea and all these miracles. Incredible time. But if you read the story, you know they quickly fell into what? Complaining. I mean, within just a very short period of time, there were some of them wanted to go back to Egypt. They had been slaves. And they wanted to go back to the slavery they were in. They lost their focus that fast. So what did Moses do? He takes them to Mount Horeb and he takes them to the mountain of the Lord to meet God. And God is so intense, they don't even want to climb the mountain. They're like, you go, Moses. We'll stay down here. Because they, God was showing them how powerful and amazing he was. And he was calling them to be his people. And he gave them the commandments. And he said, if you're going to be my people, this is what you need to do. They weren't ready. Mm. And some of them rebelled. Some of them rebelled against Moses and were saying, well, who's that guy? You know, God can speak through any of us, and, which God is never very favorable about rebellion. I'll tell you that. Right. You know, the, when, when, when Aaron and Miriam wanted to split off and, and, and leave Moses, he struck them with, with, uh, right. with leprosy. Right. Oh, man. There was a time when they went back to the false gods that they had done before. What did God do? He opened the earth and it swallowed a bunch of them. A lot of them were destroyed. They weren't ready yet. But he gives them the commands, he gives them the teaching, and he still lets them go to the promised land, but they get to the promised land, and what do they do? They chicken out. They're scared to go in the promised land. They send spies. That wasn't God's idea. They, God just told them to march in and take it. He said, I'll give it to you. It's yours. But they got scared. That's how we said it in my neighborhood. Yeah. Scared. Yeah. And God told them, don't be scared. Yeah. But they were scared. They weren't ready. And so what they had to do, they had to wander in the desert for 40 years. 40 years wandering. These are God's people. I mean, they've been through so much. They were less in numbers. They'd been attacked. They'd been beaten down. They'd been discouraged. Mm. A lot of them had lost their faith along the way. And there was a ragtag group that comes back to the border of the Promised Land, the Jordan River, that Joshua is speaking to here. Now, you may not relate to any of that at all, or you may relate to a lot of that. Some of you had an incredible year last year. But I know that a lot of you, from talking to you, didn't. It was a rough year. I know that a lot of people I've talked to have said, thank God 2019 is over. And we're ready to march into 2020. We're ready to grab a vision and march into the promised land. Or are we ready? Are we ready? 
spiritually? Are our hearts where they need to be? Are we spiritually ready for what God is going to show us? You know, they had such a challenge because, you know, I mean, when they left the promised land, there were people that fell, right away fell into complaining. Right away fell into discouragement. They got, they got scared. Well, how are we going to eat? You know, we're going to starve to death. We're going to, and the lesson for them that they had to learn was that the Lord will always provide. Amen. To trust God. To not take matters into their own hands. To not go try to do something different. But to stick with God. And stick with his plan. Even when it seems so difficult. It's amazing to me when you read God's version of, of what happened. And he says it multiple times throughout the Old Testament. He says, I lifted you up. I set you free. I carried you out on wings of eagles. That's a pretty cool story, right? Ask one of them how it went. Oh, man, it was hot, and we had to walk every day, and we didn't know we were going to eat, and we didn't know if there was any water around, and, and we didn't know if the other people were going to attack us and kill us all, and, and we were crying out to God all the time. What was he teaching them? Relax. To depend on him. Yeah. To trust him. God works through all situations. So even whether you had a great year or you had a rough year and you're coming in with, by the skin of your teeth to 2020, God has been working. God has been moving in your life. And I'll tell you this, if you can just have a little bit of faith, even the size of a mustard seed, which is about that big, you will see God do greater things. Amen. You will see God do great things. But here's what we got to do. First of all, we got to face the facts. Now let's go to Romans 4. Amen. We have to face the facts of where are we at. In Romans 4, it says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do whatever he had promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So, Abraham is called the father of faith. He's the guy, how old is he when he gets told that he's going to have kids? Anybody remember? 100. He's 75 years old. When he gets told, you're going to have kids like sand, like stars in the night. Okay, 75. Is anybody here 75? No, no, no. 75 is definitely beyond childbearing years, right? That we think of normally. You're not nearly thinking of starting a family at 75. Mary laughed. I'm sorry, Sarah laughed, not Mary. Sarah laughed. Are you kidding me? But he did not waver. He faced the fact that they were old, really old, that her womb was as good as dead. And yet God could still do anything, anything, Basic, simple faith. Do you believe that? God can do anything. He says he faced the facts and he did not waver. So the first thing you have to do always is face the facts. Where are we? How are we doing? How are we doing as a group? How are we doing as a ministry? How am I doing as a disciple of Jesus? Now, if you're visiting with us, you have to ask yourself, where am I at before the Lord? Am I a Christian? If the Bible's true, am I going to heaven? If, if, if you really do have to follow Jesus, am I even following him? Do I know him? Do I follow him? Now, if you're a disciple of Jesus, if you're a member of the church, you've got to stop and ask yourself, how am I doing following Jesus? How close am I to him? How am I doing 
being led by him? Is he Lord of my heart and my mind and my soul? Am I loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? We have to stop and examine ourselves, right. face reality, right? Yep. And this is probably the hardest part about January, is facing reality. You know, you know what a reality moment is? It's when you step on the scales. That's a reality moment. No matter what you thought you were doing, no matter how you thought you were doing over the holidays, that's a reality moment, right? When we go to the doctor, because the doctor wants to know not how are you feeling, but how are you actually doing, he takes tests, right? He weighs you also, she or he will weigh you, will check your blood pressure, right? They, take, they, take, they check your vital signs. Because you can say, oh man, my blood pressure feels great. <laughs> Let's test it. Oh, I'm, I'm sure I lost 10 pounds over the holiday. I kept saying no to the third piece of pie every time. <laughs> Let's get on the scale and see. And those are the realities, right? But we don't, we don't like to see those realities. But what about spiritually? How do you know how you're doing spiritually? I always wish, wouldn't it wish there was a little meter or something? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if like, like I don't know, the, the, the stronger you were spiritually, the, the, the taller you got or something. Or the stronger you got physically. You know, uh, you, could, you, could, you could somehow measure, maybe by the nose, you know. You say, bro, what's going on in your life? But we, we, we can, we, it's not so obvious. We don't have a machine that tests it. So how do you know where your heart is at? What your mindset is? There are, there are obvious signs. There are obvious clues. How much time are you reading the Bible? How much are you learning in the Bible? What are you excited about in the Bible? What scriptures are you memorizing and using a lot? What, what, what scriptures are you reading and it's making you cry? Or it's, it's strengthening you? Or it's moving you? Are you a Sunday junkie that you just go from Sunday to Sunday hoping something will help you keep going? Or can you feed yourself? Do you work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Or are you dependent on somebody else's faith? Somebody else's conviction to keep you going and doing what's right? Does your spouse have to keep you on the true and narrow path? Yeah. Or do you have your own conviction about it? How are you doing? Are you excited? You know, I was watching the, the worship team, and I'm so grateful for the worship team. Yeah. This song, they're awesome. Guys. And all that, you know, and I know we got a lot more out there in the audience, but every, it's so awesome when everybody comes together. Worship. I thought of this song when I was watching them. I was watching James Lee. And, and there's a song, I want to love like Johnny and June. And I thought, I want to worship God the way James loves God. You know? He just goes into it with all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, all his strength. That's how we're supposed to worship God. Are you excited about your faith? Are you excited about your worship? About your time of what we're going to learn, what we're going to grow? Who's going to become a Christian next year? Who in your family is going to give their heart to Jesus? Who are you going to see set free from addictions? Yeah. Whose marriage are you going to see repaired? Now, I'm, I'm saying these things, but I'll be honest, I think a lot of us are far from that. We're not there. You can tell. It shows. I think a number of us have actually become observers of worship. Wow. We just watch it happen. We don't feel like we're part of it. We don't feel it in us. But we're just watching. Now we have enough faith that we're here. Praise God. You're yeah, here. Man. Amen. Give yourself a hand. All right. <laughs> but being here doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in the garage makes me a car. You understand that? We have to face the facts. Where am I at spiritually? Am I doing well? Am I dying? Am I dead? I used to not believe in zombies. Now I see a lot of spiritual zombies. People who died spiritually and don't even know it. 
they're still going through the motions. Some of them still giving contribution, missions, but their hearts are far from God. The excitement's not there. The passion's not there. The power is not there. And they're getting beat down by Satan. And then people start wondering, well, maybe this doesn't work. Mm. I mean, because if it's all this worked, why is that couple splitting up? And why are those people fighting all the time? If this is all true, you're blaming the wrong person. You should be blaming Jesus. You should be blaming each other, right? Yeah. Well. Jesus works. Yeah. Jesus is the power. He's the way, the truth, the life. I guarantee you, whatever we do, Jesus' way works awesome. Where do we get ourselves in trouble? When we're not following him. Yeah. When we're not closer to him. And we become worldly Christians. Yeah. And, we, and we become much more the older brother instead of the younger brother in the prodigal son story. Remember that story? Yeah. The younger brother was, God, thank you. He was just like, Father, I don't deserve to be here. Make me like one of your servants. And he was just grateful to be allowed in. Where was the older brother at? He was outside critiquing everything. Why does he get attention? And I've been here all these years. And, and it, does that sound familiar? I've been here all these years sacrificing and giving and denying myself. I mean, that stuff can come out of our mouths and we don't even realize it. That it was in our hearts. That we were negative, critical, and cynical. We say, well, yeah, but we've been through a lot. Welcome to the club. We've all been through a lot. And you think it's hard in the kingdom? You're forgetting how hard it was outside of the kingdom. At least in the kingdom, we have hope always. Always. Next scripture. So Joshua 4. He tells them, in Joshua chapter 1, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down in the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord and into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask you what do these stones mean, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. You know, there are things that when we think about the past, how we deal with the past makes all the difference in how our future is going to be. Your past and how you process and look at the past will have a huge effect on your future. When my son was about two years old, every once in a while I'd see him go running down the living room like this, full speed. And I'd say, turn around, look ahead. Because you know what happens when you run looking behind? You crash, right? You can't move forward looking behind you. You have to move forward. But there are things you don't want to forget. And so he tells him, he says, look, take these stones and put them up in remembrance of what God has done for you. Because we forget what God does for us. We forget so quickly. You remember when... when when Jesus was out preaching and his family showed up because they said, the Bible says they thought he was crazy. Yeah, right. Now, wait a second. Didn't an angel talk to Mary? Right. I mean, didn't, didn't she get visions and visits from angels? And I mean, Gabriel himself talked to her. How could she now all of a sudden, you know, just a mere 30 years later, be questioning this? But as I've been a Christian a while, I realized, oh, that's totally what we do. We're that person that one Sunday, we were up here talking about all the powerful things God for, uh, did for us. And then on another Sunday, a few years later, we're complaining how, how God hasn't done anything for us. Mm. Or we even, we, we look at the past 
and color it all dark. Oh, it was horrible. It was terrible. It was so bad. And we forget all that God has done for us. Every one of us should be able to put up stones of remembrance. Because I guarantee you that God has done great things. We lose sight of that sometimes. Even in the challenges we face. Some of those challenges God allowed just to toughen us up. Just to make us grow. Just to make us depend on him. You think about for a second. What is the best times you've ever had in prayer? Like think about what's the best time you ever had? Time you felt so close to God. Tears are flowing. You just feel connected. You're begging him. You feel like his love is on you. Is it not times that were difficult? Is it not times that you were suffering? Is it not times that life was almost unbearable? Because that's our nature. You know, the, somebody once said the two most hardest things to deal with in life, one is victory, excuse me, one is defeat, and the other one is victory. One is hard times, and the other one is good times. Well, I will say this, as a group, we've been through some hard times. We've been through a lot of challenges. And I can say we, because Michelle and I, we've had our, our fair share of challenges last year. Things that have happened in our family and in our life that were just very difficult to deal with and required us to grow spiritually, to be more like Jesus. Next scripture, PowerPoint, forgot my PowerPoint. Okay. Paul says, not that I've obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul said, look, I haven't done it all, and he's done a lot. Right. But I, this is what I do. He said, I forget all of this stuff. And I focus on the future. I let it all go behind me. He said, put it behind you. You know, I'll teach you a phrase. I lived in Jersey. Any of you from Jersey? Okay, what's the phrase? Forget about it. Forget about it. Okay, that came from God. That's basically the scripture. God is saying, I know you had a lot of stuff happen, but forget about it. Focus. One thing you do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Amen. You know, we could go back over the last two, three years, of some of you the last five years, some of us the last 15 years, of all the things that shouldn't have happened that happened and the bad things and the tough things and the hardships and the challenges we faced, or we can just forget about it and focus on Jesus. Amen. I can't fix something that happened six months ago, but I can totally be with Jesus today. I can walk with Jesus this year. This is the great thing about getting new things. Is that you get to decide who you are going to be this year. Who are you going to be in 2020? Who are you going to be this month? You know, this month we're calling a month of preparation. A month of preparing our hearts and our minds for the year to come, for the life to come. Amen. We're not going to roll out everything. There's going to be a lot of changes. And Lord willing, they will be great changes. Amen? Amen? We just have to have the right heart and the right mindset. Yeah. I know this. No matter what I do, the greater the challenge, the more I need to dig in and walk spiritually. Amen. The more I need to make sure I'm close to God. Amen. I'm close to Jesus. Because if I'm not close to him, I'm telling you right now, Satan wants to sift you out. Yeah. And he'll use whatever he can, whether it's a hurt from the past or your undisciplined nature or whatever your sin is or, or a sin or an addiction or whatever. He's going to use whatever he can to sift you out. It's the Bible says it's like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he's looking at you. You gotta get close to Jesus. 
Mm. Next scripture. Let's see if my PowerPoint still works. Yeah. Listen to what God says. And we're going to close out here. For I will, tell, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. What is he saying? I'm going to pull you all together. You're all over the place. But we're going to pull together. And guess what? We are literally going to do that as a group. For the next few months at least, we're going to pull together Amen. to become what God wants us to be. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. No matter where you're at today, you could be stinking it out spiritually. Yep. God's going to help you get strong. Amen. If you're just willing to cooperate with him, get strong. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. You know, I realize I've been a Christian 37 years. I'm telling you right now, I am more fired up about my faith than ever before. I am more fired up about Jesus than ever in my life. But it has not been easy. I have to fight for the relationship I have. Because the world and Satan is always trying to take it away. I have great people around me helping me to stay focused and stay close to Jesus. He says, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Amen. So God is calling us to something great. One more PowerPoint. What's our focus this year? Well, we got to use the 2020 because it's 2020. And it'll never be 2020 again. <laughs> What's our vision? <laughs> Fix your eyes Woo! on Jesus. Yes. That's our theme for the year. Amen. Can we do that? Woo! Can we fix our eyes on Jesus? If you're visiting with us, I want to challenge you to do this with us. Fix your eyes on Jesus. What does that mean? That means we're going to read, we're going to pray, we're going to go through quiet times together, we're going to do studies together. We are going to be Jesus' people. Amen? Amen? You can say, well, Robert, duh, that's what we're here for. No, not duh. <laughs> we're going to first check ourselves. Right. How we're doing, right? Yep. And really be God's people. Amen. Really be Jesus' people. So our theme, keep your eyes on Jesus. And you will see all that God has in store for us. God bless you. Amen.